This voice annotated presentation is on diseases of the pericardium in pediatric patients. The learning objectives of this presentation are to understand the causes of pericardial disease in children, including the varied systemic conditions with which it is associated, to identify common signs and symptoms, as well as conventional means of diagnosis by laboratory, electrocardiography, and imaging and to distinguish between the myriad subtypes with respect to course, complications, and standard treatment strategies. Subtopics in this presentation will include the following. Pathophysiology of pericarditis, clinical manifestations of disease, diagnostic principles, including differential diagnosis, and treatment strategies. Special consideration will be given to constrictive pericarditis, a unique form of the condition. Major diseases that involve the pericardium are varied in their pathophysiology. In some, pericardial involvement is one manifestation of a generalized illness. In others, it is a prominent component. Broad categories include congenital anomalies, including partial or complete absence and cysts, infectious causes, including viruses, bacteria, immune complex deposition, tuberculosis, fungi, and parasites, connective tissue diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatic fever, systemic lupus erythematosus, systemic sclerosis, and sarcoidosis, metabolic and endocrine dysfunction including uremia, hypothyroidism, and chylopericardium, hematologic and oncologic conditions like bleeding diatheses, primary or metastatic malignancy, or radiotherapy, and other factors like penetrating or blunt trauma, catheter-related iatrogenesis, post-pericardiotomy syndrome following cardiac surgery, aortic dissection, and idiopathic causes. Pericardial inflammation results in accumulation of fluid in the pericardial space. The nature of the fluid varies according to cause. It may be serous, fibrinous, purulent, or hemorrhagic. Cardiac tamponade occurs when the pericardial fluid reaches a level that compromises cardiac function. This may be in excess of one liter in adolescence. Once a critical volume is reached, pressure rises rapidly with small incremental changes and can result in severe cardiac compression, leading to impaired ventricular diastolic filling, decreased blood pressure, decreased cardiac output, and even shock. The first symptom of pericardial disease is often precordial pain, which is typically sharp or stabbing in nature and sensed over the precordium and left shoulder or back. Pain may be worse when supine and relieved by sitting or leaning forward. This is likely referred pain from diaphragmatic and pleural irritation. Cough, dyspnea, abdominal pain, vomiting, and fever may also occur. Physical exam findings will depend on the degree of fluid ac accumulation. A friction rub may be noticed when the effusion is small, or muffled heart sounds when the effusion becomes larger. Tachycardia, neck vein distension, and pulsus paradoxus, or an exaggeration of the decrease in systolic blood pressure with inspiration due to increased pulmonary venous return to the left side of the heart, also suggest significant accumulation. A pulsus paradoxus greater than 20 millimeters of mercury may be an indicator of tamponade. Specific findings will depend on the underlying mechanism of disease. An electrocardiogram is often informative. Low voltage of the QRS complexes results from a damping effect of the fluid. Pressure on the myocardium leads to tissue injury that may cause diffuse ST segment elevation. Generalized T-wave inversion results from inflammation and tends to follow ST segment changes. Electrical alternons is demonstrated by variable QRS amplitude. Consider, though, that the electrocardiogram may be normal, especially in the early acute phase. A relatively large effusion might cause an enlarged cardiac shadow with so-called water bottle configuration on chest X-ray. Lung fields are usually clear. 
Echocardiogram is the most sensitive technique for evaluating the size and progression of effusion, which appears as a clear, echo-free space between the epicardium and the pericardium. The presence of both anterior and posterior effusion generally indicates a large collection. Flattening of septal motion and collapse of the right ventricular outflow tract during diastole are signs of tamponade. Viral and acute benign pericarditis are considered synonymous as they typically occur in tandem. Common viral instigators include Coxsackie virus B, influenza, echovirus, and adenovirus. Pathogenesis is unclear but may be related to a hypersensitivity reaction. Most cases are mild with recovery taking a few weeks. Only symptomatic treatment is indicated, for example, non-steroidals. Cardiac tamponade or chronic relapsing illness may occur in rare, severe cases. Aspirin and or corticosteroids are sometimes indicated in these individuals, the majority of whom have an excellent prognosis after one to two years of medical therapy. Tamponade may require urgent pericardiocentesis. Pericarditis can be difficult to distinguish from myocarditis, but echocardiogram is crucial in this regard. Treatment for heart failure is required in the latter. Purulent pericarditis is most often associated with bacterial infections including pneumonia, epiglottitis, meningitis, or osteomyelitis. Signs and symptoms of the primary infection should be expected. Purulent pericarditis can lead to acute tamponade and death if untreated. Treatment may involve pericardiocentesis and intravenous antibiotics. Closed aspiration can yield a sample for diagnostic purposes and be acutely life-saving, but open drainage and removal of adhesions may be necessary to prevent recurrence. The most commonly implicated organisms are Staphylococcus aureus, Haemophilus influenza type B, and Neisseria meningitidis. The tuberculous pericarditis is very rare in children. Immune complex-mediated pericarditis may occur about a week after initiation of therapy for severe systemic infection with meningococcus or H. flu. Therapy includes anti-inflammatory agents. Pericarditis occurs in acute rheumatic fever as a component of pancarditis. It is associated with acute valvulitis. It generally responds to steroids and tamponade is very rare. Pericarditis is a common manifestation of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. It may, in fact, be the only manifestation, sometimes preceding onset of arthritis by months or years. Treatment consists of steroids or salicylates. Uremic pericarditis can occur in the presence of prolonged severe renal failure and results from chemical irritation of the pericardium. It may culminate in tamponade or cause recurrent hypotension during hemodialysis. Pericardiectomy may be required. Neoplastic pericardial effusion is seen in patients with Hodgkin disease, lymphosarcomas, and leukemia. It results from direct neoplastic invasion of the pericardium. Tamponade may occur late in the course. Patients with malignancy may also acquire pericarditis as a result of radiation therapy to the mediastinum. Pericardial effusions may be seen for one to two weeks following open heart surgery in as many as a quarter of pediatric patients. The syndrome is a nonspecific hypersensitivity reaction to trauma. Low-grade fever, lethargy, loss of appetite, or abdominal pain may be apparent. Chest pain may or may not be present. This entity typically responds well to aspirin or other NSAIDs. Corticosteroids may be indicated in severe cases. Treatment is typically maintained for one to three months. Constrictive pericarditis, usually occurring months or years after initial insult, deserves special attention. It may also occasionally be an acute, rapidly progressive process. Most often there is no immediately preceding illness. Clinical manifestations result from impaired diastolic ventricular filling and depressed myocardial contractility and function. Hepatomegaly and neck vein distension may be prominent findings on exam. An early pericardial knock by auscultation or evidence of calcification on chest x-ray are evidence of more severe disease. Protein-losing enteropathy with hypoproteinemia and lymphopenia may be associated. 
Constrictive pericarditis may be difficult to distinguish from chronic restrictive cardiomyopathy, except the prognosis is usually excellent with prompt intervention. Definitive diagnosis may require exploratory thoracotomy and direct examination. Radical pericardiectomy with decortication of the pericardium over a wide area of the heart, including the systemic and pulmonary veins, is the only effective treatment. Surgery typically elicits a rapid response characterized by increased cardiac output and prompt diuresis. In summary, pericardial disease in children is associated with multifarious, systemic, and localized causes. Its negative influence on cardiac function ranges from trivial to extremely severe, according to etiology and volume of fluid buildup. Key tools in diagnosis include thorough physical examination, electrocardiography, and echocardiography. Effective treatment and accurate prognosis are highly dependent on underlying disease.